Welcome to Weather Extra on CBS News Bay Area. I'm KPIX 5 meteorologist Paul Hagen. Every week we're taking a closer look at a different weather topic, a deeper dive than what we can do within our daily weather casts on KPIX. This week I want to give you some additional information about a couple of research papers that have been in the news recently. One about dry lightning and California wildfires, the other about the risk of a so-called California mega flood. Let's start with the study that focused on dry lightning in California. It's a topic that is frequently top of mind this time of year. Just within the last few weeks, we've seen a couple of dry lightning threats around the Bay Area, and several dry lightning sparked fires are burning around the state as I speak. A paper published this month in the journal Environmental Research Climate looked at over 30 years of lightning and precipitation data to examine several large dry, dry lightning outbreaks and determine what they have in common and hopefully give us some analytical tools to better diagnose future threats. Dry lightning is so important to study because unlike human-caused fires that start in a single location, lightning outbreaks can ignite multiple simultaneous wildfires, creating a substantial challenge for fire crews trying to contain those fires. We saw that just two years ago in August 2020. All seven of the, of the largest fires in California history have occurred in the last five years, and four of these were caused by lightning, according to Cal, uh, Cal Fire data. So let's run through some of the important findings from this study. The researchers found that dry lightning in California occurs most frequently in July and August, but lower elevations, which includes the Bay Area despite our varying landscape, tended to see the peak activity lingering a little bit longer into September and October when fire fuels are even drier. In lower elevations, lightning sparked about 30% of fires, but those accounted for nearly 50% of the total burned area. The study also highlighted the atmospheric conditions conducive to dry lightning outbreaks, specifically a combination of hot surface temperatures, above normal moisture content in the mid-levels of the atmosphere, some kind of trigger to initiate storm development, and unstable conditions that allow developing showers to grow into actual thunderstorms. More importantly, the research team identified a big picture pattern that allows these factors to come together. A heat dome area of high pressure off to our east, some kind of upper level disturbance off the Pacific coast, the flow of air in between the high and low funnels monsoonal moisture across California, and that upper level low acts as the trigger to get things started. But not all of these setups result in dry lightning outbreaks because everything has to come together just right for a significant threat to emerge. Looking again at the checklist, if the surface level temperatures aren't hot enough, the storms won't be dry because not all the rain will evaporate on the way down. If the trigger to initiate the storms doesn't arrive when the greatest amount of moisture is in place, we'll likely just see a couple of showers. And it's the same story if the atmospheric instability isn't in place at just the right time. In hindsight, that's what makes the August 2020 lightning barrage so remarkable. Each of these factors came together almost perfectly, and the amount of atmospheric moisture was absolutely off the charts thanks to the remnants of a tropical system being sucked northward across the state. But a dry lightning threat doesn't have to produce the 10 to 12,000 lightning strikes like we saw in 2020 to be dangerous. Under 100 strikes can cause significant problems, especially as more and more of the Bay Area's population lives near the urban wildland interface where fires can quickly spread into residential areas. The other research study I want to highlight focuses on the potential for an extreme event on the other side of the spectrum, the threat of a so-called mega flood. This was published in the journal Science Advances and simulates a pair of extreme month-long winter storm sequences in California, one based on the historical recent record and one from a much warmer future climate. Essentially, it asks the question, how much worse would an extreme but in the realm of possibility event, something like a multi-week series of successive atmospheric river storms like what happened with the Great Flood of 1862, what is something like that it's California now, or in the future in a much warmer climate. Both the historically based and future storms in the study generated huge amounts of precipitation, but the future scenario is considerably wetter, around 45% wetter on a statewide basis. But local effects are even wilder. In mountainous areas where the terrain more efficiently squeezes precipitation from the atmosphere, the simulated 30-day precipitation totals were over 100 inches. That's over eight feet of water. This intensification, along with increases in shorter-term daily and hourly precipitation rates, indicates a heightened risk of flash flooding, debris flows, and river flooding in a warming climate. 
And it's not just the amount of precipitation that's concerning. It's how it falls as rain or as snow. The researchers who published the study also found changes in what they call the rain-snow balance in California's mountains, with the future scenario much more falling as rain instead of snow at elevations as high as five to 6,000 feet. This map outlines the percentage decrease in total snowfall, and it's significant. In addition to that additional rain boosting the flooding and debris flow risk for downslope watersheds, this also has troubling implications for a further decrease in the amount of moisture that will be stored in the snowpack of the High Sierra. In other words, even if a large amount of moisture fell in California in a particular winter, it wouldn't necessarily have any beneficial impacts the following dry season. Interestingly, the researchers found there may be some predictability to when an event like a mega flood might occur, specifically during a moderate to strong El Nino event. El Nino winters are generally wetter than normal to begin with in California, which means that flooding associated with any extreme event in those conditions would be amplified by the fact that the ground would probably already be wet. I mentioned earlier that these kinds of extreme rainfall events do exist in the historical record, the most famous example being the Great Flood, so-called, in 1862. But in addition to increasing the magnitude of an extreme event, climate change also makes these events just more likely to begin with. The researchers found that climate change has already doubled the risk of a California mega flood compared to 100 years ago. Each degree of additional global warming will lead to further significant increases in that risk moving forward. Estimates are that by 2060, an extreme mega flood event will be between four and seven times more likely. In other words, a storm sequence that may have only occurred once every 200 years could now occur every 30 to 40 years. So let's acknowledge that it does feel a little bit odd to be talking about a potential mega flood in the midst of our latest mega drought. But that's the scary thing about climate change. We have to worry about everything. While farmers and ranchers, emergency managers, city planners, and other officials have to be devoting considerable energy towards drought response and mitigation, they also have to keep in mind the threat of the complete opposite problem. Add in the omnipresent threat of wildfires in California, and it feels like we're playing whack-a-mole with all of these potential hazards. Predictably, a lot of the national media coverage of this particular study has focused on the potential for disaster and large parts of the Central Valley being temporarily transformed into a shallow inland sea. But there's a reason for optimism, because with this mega flood threat comes an associated opportunity. The best of all possible mitigation strategies would be to improve flood resilience infrastructure in a way that allows us to capture and store excess rainfall. That would subsequently give us greater water reserves to withstand future droughts. That's it for this week's Weather Extra. If you want to further explore either of the studies I talked about in this segment, head over to Twitter. I pinned a tweet to the top of my profile with a link to each of them. I'll be back next week to cover another topic, and we're always looking for new ideas for these segments. If you have a weather or climate question, just email it to weatherextra at kpix.cbs.com.